Okay, well, I guess I should start a little bit earlier. Uh, because, I mean, when I was a little kid and I saw, you know, when I saw somebody do something, you know, which would become hip hop later. Okay. The, the main aspect was that I never saw this before. And when I say never saw it before, I, I would relate to school. I would relate to television okay. or just, you know, just society, right? So, first when I was very little, my brother started writing graffiti. Okay. So, you know, one example, I saw one of the markers. The marker was big. Yeah. So, the first thing I said, well, this big marker, where did it come from? I've never seen this marker. So, I'm like, okay, this, the marker's so big. So when you write your name, you can see it. Yes. In school, we have little markers. You know? So I already said, there's something different. Then these funny pens, the, the uni pens, you know, the materials, the tools of the trade. I started seeing all these different cans of ink. I'm like, where did this come from? But I was like, cool, I'm going to try it. Then, you know, I was younger, so I would watch and I'd imitate. I'd say, okay, this is what they do. Boom. Oh, they have a, a name for that? That's called a mop tip? Okay, I'm going to call it a mind. So I started adapting to this language. Okay? okay? So this is around 1978. And it was just cool. It was colorful. I like to draw. So in school, so I'm you know, writing, which is called, it's called writing, you know what I'm saying? was something that I started falling into, but I'd never seen it. And then, of course, you know, the trains, the subway trains, was a big, a big deal because this is where you, you know, you write your name everywhere, but the subway train was the big leagues. That was the big stuff. So, automatically, I'm learning these things about a lifestyle that I didn't know existed. It wasn't in my mother didn't tell me, my teacher didn't tell me, the newspaper didn't tell me, school books didn't tell me. So, I'm learning this, this lifestyle that's underground. Okay, you know, then of course the music, you know, played a part. I was, my, a friend of mine was given a cassette tape with some live DJ and MC. I heard that, I said, oh shit. I'm hearing people, I'm hearing music and I'm hearing people rhyming, doing harmony. Sounds crazy. Never heard it on the radio. Never seen that shit in TV. Once again, this is another element that I'm saying. This is underground, man. This is cool. I didn't know about it. Some of my friends didn't even know about it. You know, and this was some people, uh, God, uh, jam from the Bronx. And then also, at the same time, a cassette tape of a jam from Staten Island. And this is 78. So people don't know Staten Island. They were getting down over there back in the days. So on that note, the, uh, the aspect of learning the language of these things was essential. You know, you, you, you ask, you know, like, what's, what's this called? You know, you, didn't, you wanted to be a, come a part of it, so you learned the language. You know, the, what the words co were called. If you did a piece, you did a window down, or you, you know, top to bottom. This is a language. If you would have told me this language, yo, you're going to do a top to bottom, I'd be like, what are you talking about? But in the graffiti language, top to bottom is a full car, taking the top, top of the train and the bottom and doing the name across the whole train. So, an example of the language that was created by the people that were recording. So, then of course, looking at, you know, certain uh, types of artists and the way they did their work. The way they said the words, <laughs> the way they played the music, and noticing also that it wasn't just like a, you know, it wasn't, it was, it was white guys, Spanish people, black, there's a Chinese guy in my, my neighborhood, DJ Chinese Flash, <laughs> white Flash, I'm not playing with you, this is serious shit. So I'm saying, all this shit is happening and it's communal, it's not, yo, you, know, you can't do this if you ain't, if you ain't uh, white. Or you can't do this if you ain't Spanish or black. So I'm not, there's no color line separating it. Okay, okay. But of course, the first guys that I seen doing specific things were black, the black guys in my neighborhood. And I was concerned if I should be able to do it too. Mm -hmm. But uh, but at the times that I chose to, I was accepted. You know, everybody jumped in and you got your shit off. So. You know, at that time, each of the elements of what will become hip hop culture were existed. Mm -hmm. but they weren't really pulled together, but they had similarities. The similarities were the individual, 
and the individual expressing who they were in what they did and getting accept, acceptance from the community, the same underground community. Yes. Not from school, not from mom, the underground people that did these things, because not everybody did. So automatically there's this community that is conscious. If you go see the trains and you sit on the platform and you watch the trains and you see who's doing some fucking crazy shit. Mm -hmm. So you're like, yeah, I respect that dude, that dude is nasty. I'm going to get my shit off, etc. So this, this combining of all these elements in the 80s, you know, uh, through the story of, you know, Africa Bambada, just, you know, coining it hip hop and all this, you know, the way the stories are told. Uh, and it becoming a culture and we started saying the words hip hop culture more often in the 80s because the media came along and you know, conscious people from the 70s like Bambada wanted to really let people know that they coincided with each other. And I can relate to DJing, MCing and writing and also dancing as very similar attributes. They're very similar. They have the same things. You gotta, you know, you express yourself in those aspects. It, it's art. So for me to ask if it's a culture, yes, it's definitely a culture. It has its traditions. It has its language. It has its uh, terminologies, of course. Uh, it has its fashion. You know, there's a way that you dress. You know, it, and uh, so to me, to 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 put that all together, that's a sub a underground subculture, which has a language and it's a way that people relate to each other. So I see it as a culture. Okay. Yeah. And also, not to mention the roots, the roots of our people. Prior to this, like a lot of what we brought into our writing came from our childhood and our families. We have Caribbean families. We have people from the, from the north and south of the states. We have people from, you know, all back, Europe also. I mean, people migrated to New York from many places. You, know, mm -hmm. you can the list goes on and on so we bring those aspects into the culture too so so it's it's a it's a subculture that became a solid culture yeah. with the media and so forth my experience dealt with i think internally i had this i was at an age where being radical or being you know doing something daring and different was 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 kind of like the way to go mm -hmm. so in my situation i go to school come home from school do homework watch tv you know the life you know weekend go outside play all day you mm -hmm. know go play sports you know, do so. so when these things these things came into my vision mm -hmm. it was like a, a fresh breath of fresh air okay. for me now and it was art it was just like it was artistic in a sense, like, I want to try that and see how good I can do it. I think I can do that. You know, maybe there was a need for me to express myself. The social situation in the streets at that time, I mean, I was 12. I wasn't too in-depth with, you know, too many things about, you know, how our borough, uh, how Manhattan and, and, and the mayor, and I wasn't into that. I was too young. Mm -hmm. So, for me, I can't really relate to, there was a a need for me to write my name because I was mad at the world. No, I was a kid. Yes. But there were, of course, people prior to me. I started in 1978. Of course there's people coming up in certain parts of the 70s, the 1970s, and even 60s to 70s. If we look at, you know, the situation in the United States and the East and West Coast, there was a lot going on. Okay. So I can't answer the question on behalf of them. Yes. But we can read about that. I mean, it's written, you know, we talk mm -hmm. about, you know, the Black Panther Party, we talk about the Young Lords, we could talk about all these people that were upset with their way they were living, the condition, the way they were treated, you know, we talk about, you know, the, the whole movement, the music, the musical revolution of, of how people were writing music that dealt with revolution, that dealt with having fun and, you know, and, and, and being free. You know what I'm saying? Those are all attributes, but of course, for, like I said, at 12 years old, I think I need, I had a need to just do more, you know, and just take a chance on something and try it. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, when you talk about people like Africa Mambada and, you know, they're in a different neighborhood, they're in the Bronx, you know, some, some neighborhoods were cool, mm -hmm. reasonable, some neighborhoods were really bad. 
you know. So think about it. You might be, you know, in a neighborhood where, you know, you, your your mind is saying, there's nothing here, you know. This is a terrible. I have to wake up and look at all this stuff. And there's nothing to be happy about. But you hear music, you play music, it makes you happy. You know, you, you do a nice painting, it makes you happy. You know, to each person, there's his own reason why to come in. So for me, you know, I actually was when, with the first element. I mean, it was I was doing something that wasn't good. <laughs> if you're defacing property, I mean, I was riding on subway trains. I was riding on bus stops and people's buildings. When you think about that, that's actually not too cool. But as a kid, my first object was look at my name. Secondly, it was like don't get caught by the police. <laughs> so, you know, that's a 12-year-old concept, but but it's it's way it was. When it came to the dancing and the DJing, it was just like, I want to try it, and I tried it and kept on. So I think the older guys from that decade would be able to answer that question mm -hmm. a lot better than I can. Okay. It's, it's rubbed off on everybody because it became so, such a, a huge, you know, multi-billion dollar industry. That you can't help but hear it and see it everywhere you go. Yeah. It's kind of funny. You know, I, uh, you know, I, I was on a plane coming back from, uh, I actually was on a plane while, uh, back in, uh, 97, and we were doing some, some stuff with our dancing, and we were on an actual plane where they're showing us in a commercial mm -hmm. for Calvin Klein, and we're breaking and we're doing our thing, and I'm looking at it and saying, how's this happening? And then I'm coming from Korea, and I'm seeing a bunch of B-boys in the Korean Tourism Agency act. I go in New York City, a bus goes by and there's a banner and there's a dude doing an air flare. I'm like, it's everywhere. You know, you hear the radio, you know, you got somebody rapping and they talking about shoes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, or selling a car. I, there's a car commercial Cadillac and they're playing Apache. And I'm like, yo, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. So it's everywhere and it's marketable. Um, so it, affected, it, it affects people in a lot of ways, but it's also because it's such a big, big thing. You know, music is the aspect which really catapulted hip hop culture. Music is the real aspect. You know, uh, the visuals came alongside the music, the music, but you know, the rap element was the main element that exploded internationally, to where all the countries get involved and do it. But of course, hip hop can affect people in different ways too. There's a lot of people that don't like it. <laughs> There's a lot of people that will always continue to say, you know. Look at these guys, you know, from the ghetto, you know, continuing to do this bullshit and deface property and, you know, they're going nowhere. This is a, this is a reality. Not everybody loves hip hop, you know what I'm saying? But, um, you know, like all things is good and bad. And it's like, I think that people have learned to live with it. And I think people over the years have learned to respect the power of youth. There's people that, you know, in the communities that will make a dollar off of it. But there's kids that, when they see it, it changes their life. Mm -hmm. you know, there's kids that don't have anything that when they try it, they fucking, what's that? Oh, I want to do that too, Griffey. And they get good. There's guys, like back in the days, the same thing. Like, oh, there's kids, man, that just, they devote their whole day to writing in the book or going to do something or practicing. And that's not the business aspect. That's, that's the art culture. That's the the freedom of expression, that's the having fun aspect of hip hop culture. Okay. So it affects us internationally because it's a huge commodity, it's a huge business. But it affects us in the community too because it's, it's a form of expression and it's a way to get acceptance from your friends and it's a way to make a name for yourself. You know, you can get popular, you know, you can practice and people say, yo, that guy is the, on that label, he's the best. And this feels good when you're a kid, so it affects us in both ways. I, my, when I was a kid, I didn't have a plan to become a b-boy. I didn't have a plan to be a dancer, and I didn't plan to be sitting here in 2012 talking about b-boying when I'm 46 years old. That is something I would have never imagined. I mean, I say this many times, if you would ask me back in 1980, what do you think you're going to be in 2012, which would, is, would be, of course, 32 years later, I guarantee you I would not have been said I'm going to be breaking somewhere, doing a contest, and being in charge. Hell no. Mm. 
1980, I was a young, young man trying to figure out what his future was going to be. I was thinking, what are you going to do with your life? You know, what college are you going to go to? You know, what do you want? You know, and at that age too, I was 16, 17. So you're lost. Teenager, man, you just want to have summers and have fun in the summer. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not responsible yet. You know, you don't have to have a job yet. You know, so I was radical at that time. But, um, you know, I, I was a person among my friends that had an opportunity. Well, I was not the only, Rocksteady wasn't the only dancing crew in New York. There were hundreds of people, but we had a chance. And we were also diverse and we were good. We got that chance. We just happened to be at the right place at the right time to be getting these opportunities put in front of our face. <coughs> because of that aspect and us getting these chances, it affected my life in a way where it affected my education, my school. I had to go to, when, they, when I first went on my first tour, I had to have a tutor. Because the school said, you can't just leave school for two weeks. What happened to your work? You take this work with you, and you got to get someone to help you with the work. And you come back, you give the work. You know, the school has rules. You can't just leave whenever you want to leave school. That was the first aspect. So it started affecting me on behalf of something that I was already a part of, which was my education. At 17 years old, somebody telling me, you're going to London. I'm saying, yo, this is great. I'm not thinking about school. I'm saying, yo, I'm going on an airplane? <coughs> you know, you're, you're like a young kid getting excited. And you're with your friends. And you're taking your habits of the street to another level. And everybody loves you when you do it? Come on, man. You're living in heaven. You're like, you, you do a little move and everybody goes crazy. Yes. So that was like, I want that. This is, this is great. And, you know, leaving and coming back, I'm seeing that we, we're, we're the sh we got a chance. And everybody on my block is, yo, man, that's beautiful. But they're not going. I'm going. Yeah. So it affected me in a way to where I started, you know, saying, yo, this is, this is kind of cool. I like this. But there were people that were in power, our manager or someone, that say, we have a plan for you. So they put these things in front of us and they said, we're going here. We said, okay, we don't say no, we just go. So we weren't really structuring our, I didn't have a foundation behind me okay. that dealt with it, an industry of dance. My mother is not a lawyer. She's not a dancer. My mother was my foundation, and she tried to help me, but if you don't know the language of business, you could be smart too, but you don't know. You have to be educated in that area. So we were being led in a direction, you know, as young kids, and the years passed by to where some of us didn't have that solid foundation. So it affected my future. I, I was so busy dancing and traveling that I wasn't thinking about my, another foundation, which is a skill or a degree, you know, from the institutions of education. And I was thinking about, yo, man, next time we're going to see this, we got to go through this. Yo, they gave us this over here. I got money in my pocket. So it affected me and a few of us to where we didn't have a solid idea of what our future was. <coughs> I stuck with it. You know, I worked. You know, it was bad. There was an exploitation period where they just took breaking, they cha-ching, and then they threw it in the street again. And a lot of us went back to the street. So, you know, that was, you know, now I'm back in the real truth of society. Now I'm in the street standing on my feet saying, where are you at now? You don't got no job now. What are you going to do? I'm back on board. You know, at that time, I was still a young, young person with a lot of things on my mind. And I was used to getting attention. You know, from the public, from the friends, I was used to having money, all those things kind of stopped, and I wanted to maintain it. And like all my friends and everybody at the, in the 80s, we were having fun going out partying, and we were doing things, crazy things, and getting high and doing stuff that, you know, at that age you experiment with, and some of us did better than others. And a lot of us had a hard time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wrapped up the 80s into the 90s, you know, trying to get myself together, and started working a job and I was working. I was working for years and then, you know, off and on I'll do a little break, you know, about blah, blah, just from the heart, you know, not no show or nothing. I just and then so my not now my mind is family. Oh I got a girlfriend. Oh I'm having a baby in nineteen ninety. Oh this is now this is a man's life and what a man thinks is life. And I experiment into this venture and I get married. So this is not really like a B boy thing, you know, it's more like, you know, life goes on, dude. It was what it was. You know, around that time, out of nowhere, 
comes right back in my face. Here comes the breaking again. Boom. So I'm like, nah, man, I can't do this shit. This is I was about 165 pounds. I was big, with a full beard, wearing suits every day. You know, you wouldn't believe it if I show you pictures. <laughs> and uh, I looked like I was already in my 30s, late 30s, when I, when it came back around. Because uh, I was just living a different lifestyle. You know, like I said, the dance has always been in my heart. Like, if I went to a party at any time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get down because everybody's, yo, Kenny, come on, come on. You know, like, they, they, it's not a show. It's just like, yo, this is what you did all your life. You know, so I never stopped breaking. You know, breaking is a thing that comes from the heart. It's like riding a bike. You can ride a bike at any fucking time. You start when you're two years old, right? But you can still ride a bike at any time you want. That's like breaking. So, you know, coming up into the 90s, you know, it just came back in my face and it's like, you know, I was in college at the time. I was going to university. I was going for uh, uh, telecommunications. And I wanted to, I had this funny thing in the back of my mind about d doing films, about writing and doing films. Because I, I did some half inch video editing at NYU as a part of a special program. And I was just thinking, yeah, I want to do films. I want to be a filmmaker or a writer. But then, boom, yo, we're doing this show. You know, a couple of my friends got killed in the street. We're doing this play. I got sucked back in, you know. Mm -hmm. Friends that I used to dance with, let's do this. I said, let's do it. And, I, and it was hard. You know, I was heavy. I was killing my body. But over the years, bang, bang, bang. So I'm back in this frame. Opportunities come and go. You know, I was talking to you about this big roller coaster. But still, I'm just riding the flow. You know, I'm riding where I'm going. You know, like, you know, I mean, I, my, my, my dreams were put on hold for a second, or my, my short-term goals about getting a degree. You know, they're saying, yo, let's go to fucking Germany for, you know, I'm like, okay, let's go. It's, that's beautiful. Traveling to me is like, you know, you can always go to college. <laughs> but, you know, you're not always going to get someone to fly you across the fucking ocean, put you away, give you money to eat, pay you, and rock the floor and get props. That's a good feeling. So I said, I kind of like that. I'm going to go. And then it just kept on going. But I was still working. I started, you know, I started, I kept trying to work a job and then at one point it just, you know, I made a decision to just do it. Now, you know, I, we're talking about how it affected me, you know, socially. You know, I started a family, I had kids and everything. And it, it was a decision where I had to be responsible of myself as a father and my commitments to my children because I brought them in the world and I had to navigate them into their adulthood yeah. you know I didn't want them to, you know I didn't want them to just not be having a dad and be away from them all the time and there were times that I was gone and they would be upset and then, you know it affected my relationship you know as an artist you're gone you're coming back it affected it, it had its toll on my relationship it took a toll on my marriage you know but at the same time I was always there always there for the kids going down boom taking them if I wasn't booked if I was booked ah it's messed up you're not here you know, but if I wasn't booked, it's messed up night not working. <laughs> so, you know, I couldn't win. I couldn't win. You know, it's like, you're a loser. Oh, you're good. You're not here. You're, you're doing, you're winning. You're getting booked, famous, but you're not here. You know, so I couldn't win. But I was following my heart. I kept on following my heart. I, I couldn't, I couldn't resist it, you know. And I, and I always said to myself, I said, there was, there was this story I saw about a, a boxer, famous boxer. I think it was a. Uh, very famous boxer from the 40s and 30s or something. And he stopped his boxing for his marriage or something and his wife because she wanted him to stop. And he stopped and 20 years later he just had a, such a regret that he stopped because he never wanted to. And he lived miserable later on in his life. This is some story that I heard. I, for some reason I just said, you know what, man, like, I want to I wanna keep doing this, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I know people are upset, but it's my life, you know. I'm going to have to be responsible down the line. For, for my failures and my successes. But I'm not going to leave my failures to your decision, anybody around. You're not going to tell me how I'm going to fail. If I'm going to fail, I'm going to do it myself. You know, I'm going to take the chance. And if I succeed, I'll do it myself. Because if I do what the next person wants me to do, mm -hmm. you know, and I succeed, I don't really feel like I succeeded. And if I do what the next person wants me to do and I fail, I, I you know, I don't really feel like, you know, I'm gonna feel like I failed because I didn't go with my heart. And I, don't, I hope that conveyed, I hope that came out right. So long story short, socially, yes man, it had an impact on my future. The dancing made me have to make decisions at a time and crossroads in my life. 
But, you know, I'm sitting here testimony today that I took the road that less people go down. I took a road that a lot of people are not going to go because it's an artist's life. And an artist's life is never guaranteed. So, but then again, I'm having so much fun. You know, I'm getting respect. I'm getting, you know, uh, admiration. I'm getting people that are coming up to me saying, yo, Kenny, man, when I first saw you, you know, you changed my life. And wild style, that was, that was when I started. But, you know, some of these things, when you hear them, you're like, God, that's kind of cool, man. And sometimes you think, nah, he's just saying that because he wants to be cool. Well, she's just trying to... But after you hear it a lot, a lot, a lot, you're like, wow, man, there's something here. And I started feeling like, you don't know the future, man. Just go with it, you know? And the time goes. So I'm still here, but I mean, time is flying. You know what I mean? Now, at the outside, I mean, socially, it, it also pushed me to realize that there's an end to this, too. My body started telling me there's an end to this, too. You listen to your body. Your body says, dude. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you, no, you're not stepping, you, no, you're not going to walk today. <laughs> Your body says you're not going to walk, you're not going to walk. You know, when you hurt, you hurt. You know, I, I put a magnitude of work in two decades after the first decade. Like, I danced more in the last 15 years than, than I've ever danced. And that at a later age took a toll on my body. So, socially, it, it also made me, Say, dude, you can keep doing these good things and having fun and going around the world and paying your bills and, and, and establishing uh, artistic achievement, but don't forget this, you know, you got to keep figuring out where you're going, you know what I'm saying? So it pushed me in, in ways that seem negative, but were always positive because I feel like my, my theory, which helps me in life, is you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Wherever, you know, don't compare yourself to the next man and what you should be if you're 45. If you're somewhere... That's exactly where you're supposed to be. That's my theory. That helps me get by. Because sometimes I sit back and say, damn, I don't have life insurance. Uh, my kids this. You know, you start thinking about you're getting an older age. You know, what do you have for your future? But at the end of the day, you know what I'm saying? I mean, my theory is just like, you know, plan for that. Make sure it's there. And that, the, the aspect of not being confused helped me to start structuring the future in those areas to build a better foundation. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I do other things. So, I mean, it's a continual process as far as how it's affecting me because it's still affecting me. You know what I'm it's still affecting me now. You know, well, first of all, I have to mention that I, I didn't see that movie Mama or Hip Hop. I saw like a little part of it. And personally, I was discouraged about the part I saw because I was like, I was just like, mm. So for me, watching that part discouraged me from watching the movie, but that's, that's just yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So I can't comment on that movie. But I can comment about salsa and mambo and the, and the traditions that come from people from, uh, you know, from, from either Puerto Rico or South America. You know what I'm saying? It's, uh, you're coming into a new, if, you come, if you're coming as a second, first language Spanish into the United States, you, know, you have to learn English. You have to, you know, you have to adapt. You're bringing the, the, the heritage and the traditions from your country, whether it be Italy to Puerto Rico, wherever where you're coming from. When it comes to the, 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 the salsa and everything, you know, dance-wise, yeah, I mean, these people already danced that way, but then they came to the hood. So, you know, let's just put that aside for a second. Those existed already for a long time, those dances. You can trace them back to Bombay and you can keep going. So... <clears throat> You look at the 70s, we have to talk about the emergence of disco. Disco came into effect and the hustle dance and what people started. I saw, you know, like I said, I can't really elaborate on that mid-70s and early 70s, but the, they, had, they had something called this, the Latin hustle. You know, so of course that seems like there's attributes of salsa and being put into that. And even the stories of the early dancers, there were dancers that were new Spanish dancers. You know what I'm saying? That... They would go to a club, and they would dance the way they danced. And if they only knew salsa, that's probably they'd mix it with trying to be a part of what people did with whatever root they had. So there is an there is an aspect of not only a Latino people, but people anywhere. You come from Jamaica, you come from, you know, from Haiti, you come from wherever. That you know, you come into the, the community and you go into a house party or a club. You're gonna if you want to get involved and you feel like dancing, you're gonna dance the way that you your roots come from, combined with you being a part of whatever exists. So 
this is a very interesting aspect because I'm close. My research is very, very close to finding out that moment because this is the moment I question all the time. And I question it more now because I've had the opportunity to talk with old dancers from not, all, not one borough, not one street, tons of streets that are over 50, all right, easy, mid-50s. And um, I've, had, I've seen them dance and I've sat them down. We've done miles and miles of research. Now, there's that thin line when people stayed on the floor. Breaking was not like, let me show you how classy my dancing is. Breaking was a radical, athletic, sporadic, go-off type of hardcore thing. You know, I mean, visually, footwork always stands out like someone just running, going rapidly with fast-moving feet on the floor. That's what the main thing that reminds me of breaking. Not the spin. Those are the, the, the things that came later that I was like, yo, I got to get that. But when I think about breaking, I think about just going the fuck off fast with footwork. Because that's what visually I've never seen in my life. Thomas Flair and all that shit came later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I could say, oh, well, that's from the Olympics. But when I saw footwork, I said, I can't. Where do I? i never seen that shit. You know, and it was not in a fucking gymnasium. It was in the concrete. It was in a... In, in a park. So, when you talk about dances prior, we talk about The Rock. You know, we talk about how The Rock existed. And uh, there was a moment when, when I think it happened, and uh, I'm leaning towards 74, 75. And next year I could be corrected. Someone could say, yo, it was 65 or 82. Not 82, but you know, I could be corrected. I'm saying through my research, and I'm going to tell you why. We hear the song Apache. We hear the song It's Just Begun. We hear the song Expansions. We hear the song uh, Give It Up or Turn It Loose. When you look at the dates of these recordings, they go back. So we can't say that they're actually breaking records, even though they have no breaks. One thing I think is the thin line to where it all changed was the, comp the composition of the DJ. And this is my opinion that the disco DJ or the DJ that just spun single records and changed the volume, you know, spun music for the people. And in, in those songs, there was maybe a song that was more radical that pulled out the dancers, which would be like, these dudes are dancers. They, weren't, they, you, they didn't say b-boys back then, they said dancers. You know, so. I think when the transition of DJing, in my opinion, started cutting a break, I think that's when the, the extension of the break made people want to, that moment in, a, in one song, a song was dope, and then it breaks and it's nasty, and then it's dope. So this moment is the moment that's nasty. When you take a DJ to continue a nasty moment, the dancing has to stay nasty. It has to continue, in my opinion. So I'm thinking that people were already going to the floor. But like I said, look at back. You drop, open up, you do a, a, a physical movement, but you back up to context. You back up to dancing. Breaking was dance a little bit, go down, and you, you fucking go crazy on the floor. So I mean, that moment is what defined the separation of rocking, or what people call rock, with breaking. <clears throat> but what's important to realize is that people were breaking in the rock. So this is very important information. I talked to all the dancers, he said, yeah, that's the part where you break. And they don't break. They don't do footwork. So rock terminology, to break is a, is a rock. A lot of old rockers say break as in you start, you start doing your dope shit. You, you go off in your, in your routine or you go off in your dancing. So like I said, the more the information starts coming, the more I step back and say, man, there's a lot more that needs to be told. And there is somebody that's going to be able to break that bond. But they don't, they're probably living in the hood somewhere, living a life, going on with their life, don't care about none of this. You know? And the ones that, that are so vocal about it all probably weren't there, but they just want attention. You know? And they're saying these stories that don't give us that, that what we want because they, they can't answer it. You know, so that's the problem. All I know 
is that I'm happy I came in exactly when I came in because that's strictly b-boying. I wasn't confused when I started. I knew exactly what the fuck I wanted to do. And I saw Rocky in 78, 79, 80 because Kid Terrific, Marky D, rest in peace, Midnight Rockers from 82nd Street. Um, you know, it was groups like this that people rocked, you know, and they stayed on top. And I, you could tell, I could tell the dude was riding a horse, do the lasso, you know, pull out a gun or a bow and arrow, you know. I saw these things, but they weren't, I didn't feel like, yeah, I want to do that. I, when I saw Breaking, I wanted to do that because I was a kid and that was, it was like a dare, like, you ever play in the streets, like, yo, can you jump from there to there? Someone says, I'll try it, and you jump over something, you land there, you know, it's like being kids. But I seen rocking since I was a kid, you know, I knew what that was, but I went to Breaking, so I was completely clear on what I wanted to do. And from 78 on, no one's going to change my mind. You know, I know that breaking is what it is from 78 to now is what it is for me. Whatever happened prior, someone's going to have to step up and be honest and, and have a good memory. That's not even say honest because some people try to be honest, but they just don't remember. So it's a really good question. I think I'm getting close. I'm, I'm getting close. You know, I, I saw some guys that I thought were real B, hardcore B-boys, and when they danced, they did some, they were just rocking. I was like, oh. Like a little confused, but there were certain floor movements that I think were extended. If you look at a basic drop, if you you know look at a, a drop can be extended and moved fast. Yeah. So maybe that's the transition. I don't know, but I know that hardcore breaks, like cutting a break, that should change it. When Flash started cutting breaks, Grandmaster Flash started slashing that shit back and forth. I think it changed a lot of things. You know, it changed a lot of things. So none of the people that you've interviewed or see. Mm -hmm. They witness the first moment, or they say, yeah, there was this guy, he danced and stayed down. Yeah, it's hard because they say that what I get from some of them is that, yeah, I saw the Morelos doing that, but they used to call it freestyle. And I heard this a few different times. So a name for breaking may have been freestyle to some people. And uh, I heard that from a perspective in Brooklyn. And I heard it from a, a Bronx perspective. I'm from Manhattan. What's interesting is you're always going to hear about, you know, Brooklyn this, Bronx that. But you know, we hear no Manhattan rock. Why we don't hear about Manhattan rock? We, people were rocking in Manhattan. You know, I don't go out and say, yo, look at the Manhattan style. This is the Manhattan style. How can you create a, a borough style? So me, I'm always going to be a little radical. And I'm always going to be the one to question your answer. Because I just don't believe everything I hear. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Why is no one saying, yo, Manhattan rock, Manhattan style? I'm from Manhattan. Why would I want to say Manhattan style? It doesn't make sense to put a burrow on a style. But that's also pride. It's also pride. I'm a Brooklyn. She's starting here. So I get it. You know what I mean? I don't... You know, like I said, I mean, if it, you know, for me personally, a lot of my roots come from people that went to the Bronx and came back to my neighborhood. But at the same time, in my neighborhood, there's people my age that have their own story. They could probably be like, yo, I remember when the dudes from the Bronx came down, yo, Brooklyn came to Manhattan. You know, I don't know. But uh, I'm getting close, and I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's going to be interesting. And, I, and I'm pushing later, man. I'm really pushing the years up. When you think about TBB, you think about those TDK, you think about cruising the Bronx, we're talking 76, the, the earliest, the earliest, and I'm thinking 77 is around, and this is my opinion, a lot of motherfuckers can yell at me and get mad, but I think that shit was really booming around 77. 76, I could see it. That's why I'm thinking a lot of it really. Now, it probably started earlier, but I know that all the stories that I heard from where there was a lot of groups going around doing breaking, b boy 77. So, I mean, it's all about someone keeping it real, man, and keeping it funky and having a good memory. Good research. Yeah, I mean, it takes time, you know what? Seven Gems, man, we ain't trying to rush this, man. We're creating an archive for New York City that stays in New York City. And we want to sit on it. We don't want to just push it out and find out we're wrong. We want to take our time, 
you know. Uh, as you even saw a lot of even like that dance or all this you know, really old footage that people already start to do a lot of move on the floor. But, but they never stay there. Yeah. It's just like oh one it's crazy blow up and then the, the, to, uh, it's the, the mechanic. Yeah. The, the, like, the formula of breaking and footwork is circular, rapid twisting. It's twist, rapid twisting and running. I mean, it's hard to describe it. So when you look at James Brown, you see James Brown killing it with the legwork. You're killing it. He splits, he's fast, he's smooth, he glides. You look at a lot of groups from the groups that danced. Classy. Arm movements, really soulful, smooth stuff, spins, nice. There was so much inspiration coming from musical groups and artists, and then of, of course heritage. Now, you look at the tappers, Blues is doing amazing stuff, Lindy Hoppers, amazing stuff. But you're talking about people that were in a specific era and time where the language was what it was for that. The dress codes was, was what it was for that. B-boying is what it is because of the time that it happened. We wore kangles and fat laces and jeans or whatever. Lindy Hoppers didn't wear that. Lindy Hoppers a different time and a different thing. A Lindy Hop, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to say, yo, I wouldn't be breaking if it wasn't for Lindy Hop. That's crazy. Now, the dancers may have evolved from Lindy Hop. Yeah, Lindy Hop was an incredible time. It was... It was amazing. But I mean, at my age, how can I? I, mean, I didn't even know about Lindy Hops, like, you know, until I was way older. And stuff, until I, someone said, yo, check this out. And I was like, whoa. So my direct inspirations are only people of my culture. I can say Greg, I can say Frosty Freeze. This is the direct relative of me and my exposure to this art form. Not Fred Astaire. Motherfucker be like, yo, Fred Astaire inspired me. Okay, if I watch Fred Astaire in 1978, I guess I can be inspired because he's a great dancer, but a b-boy at that time didn't relate to dancer. B-boy related to b-boy. I didn't say, yo, I want to be a b-boy dancer. That shit don't even sound right. There was b-boy was such a cool word, and it was a cool thing. It's like, what is that b-boy? Oh, I want to be a b-boy. 